how can I respond to this and call it drawing? there is between my hand and the paper, the quietness that exists which we don't notice between my hand and the paper. And then I'm going to find the silence with this watery ink on my hand, just locate the silence, not to move, just find it here, between here and here, exists. A mystery of nothing. And the voice of this music draws up the silence. It takes the silence for a walk, you could say. do is follow it. And slowly, it begins slowly to open out a bit. And it stops, so I stop. And I roll about. It sort of breaks my heart open at the same time as I paddle in the beauty of the manifest mystery of life and I sort of become human. This faithfulness to following what you feel eventually is the language called drawing. So here we have now the model lying quietly waiting until something catches her for real and I wait too and I wait and silence dormant you could say resting you could say We abide quietly in that waiting. In fact, I'm going to move with her as she starts to move so that I can drink up the movement. The poetry, if you like. Now, I'm not particularly interested whether I get it accurate or not, but I want, through my joining in, I want to know this portion of humanity. So I want to have danced this dance. I want to know the flavor of livingness, living itself like this. I am
somewhere she will come to rest, which will become the pose. It happens like a wave arising and a wave going down, returning. So there she seems to come to rest and I want to know how it feels for livingness to live as this. So I go with my hands. And I feel this head yielded back and the delicacy of this hand so intimate and close with this cheek. And I live that and I, I live the, the curve and the, the wave of the body going down and arising again as it becomes the, what we call the leg, but there are no labels in my drawing. I, I'm just arising and falling as livingness plays itself. And just a play. And as this happens, I am the livingness, and I am touched by my own beauty as I play. And here, this, this hand here, just the hand resonating with the, this beautiful backward tilt of the head. And that backward tilt of the head has a kind of resonance and echo with this loose, yielded, delicate fingers. And then I can look, and of course the conventional mind can come in and say, wow, this is a mess. So I may come in again <coughs> with some punctuation that was pretty free flow feeling response, you could say. Now, does it need something to magnify the presence, the rest, the atmosphere of the divinity of life experiencing itself thus? And the funny thing comes in, I have no idea why, but it comes in to make it somehow stronger a bit here. Okay, so then I leave it. I don't know why I felt that. But then again it comes in, this needs a bit of balance perhaps here. And then it perhaps needs a little bit of articulation here to help satisfy the mind. It's interesting, it seems we have to give the mind enough understanding and you could call it articulation so that it's satisfied, it lies down and says, okay, okay, I, I will follow. And then you can come in and you can say, well, that's a pretty floppy drawing. But for me, if I come back later, I know what it feels like to be this. And actually, really, the drawing is so secondary, it, it can go in the bin. And this foot here, just this little, just a little toe here, resonating with this beautiful throwaway feeling of the head, carries the fragrance and the poetry of the whole. And I haven't done anything. What's important is that I, as livingness, know the taste of myself as this. Hello, is that beautiful? Amen, actually, to that. That is the beginning and ending of doing, as far as I'm concerned.
Hold it. sense that when I started doing these workshops I didn't know they were workshops and I was sharing um, a way of drawing that I had been shown was being shown by an old man called Cecil Collins and um, what he was showing me cut through what I knew and I was very excited about it so um, with the encouragement of Cecil, basically, um, I started sharing what I was learning with friend, a friend, and then it became friends. And I thought, indeed, it was about drawing more freely. End of story. But over the years, and I called it originally, it hadn't got a name at all, and we just gathered together and had a good time and eventually it became, I made a little handmade slip of paper called it, uh, exploring the nature of creativity through life drawing. 
and it absolutely was us exploring what it means to be creative, which at that stage we thought was to be perhaps a bit wild, a bit energetic, a bit fun and blah, blah. Uh, but over the years, and looking around the world, it dawned on me that this wasn't enough and it wasn't really what it was about because um, something of it touched something in me that I hadn't met before and I realized I suppose over time that that this that I touched um, was the same for everybody. Whatever we learned and whatever we did fitted the bill of our lives, good relationships, good marriages, good children, good jobs, glamorous living, successful living. If you're happy living, maybe, and if you don't look happy, you find, if you don't feel, be really happy, you find a way of looking happy. And this was not satisfied, but we didn't know it. And um, I was quite old. I remember going up my stairs at home and I must have been 50-ish already and I suddenly realized I didn't know what I liked and I didn't know what I wanted and it was shocking to be halfway through one's life and then I realized <coughs> with this sort of floating around within the field of my perception that actually drawing and the way we drew touching this yearning for something we didn't know was there we hadn't noticed something that was there and I discovered by degrees that by <coughs> By being quiet enough, by becoming quiet enough when we friends were drawing, that the life of the pose of the person who was modeling had, had, was able to talk to, to this, which was unlocatable in a way, but it was deeply satisfying. And um, then over time, by this time, the workshops had become workshops, and over time, Moag, who I met at the art college when she was a student and I was doing the classes, and she started modeling for me, and other people came in, and there was a little group of us. Slowly, over time, it just dawned on me that we were drawing ourselves home into that which we already are. So the title doesn't really make sense. <laughs> Well, I can't really do that, no. That's why we do the classes, the workshops. Because actually, my experience is that what I'm talking about can't actually be named. There are a thousand names in our part of the planet. We call it, we label it G-O-D, which is fine as a label. <coughs> but it's got connotations, so we don't necessarily know what those letters mean. And I think it's true to say we do the workshops because of this, because we have to find it for ourselves. And it's a field, you could say, unlocatable. of apparently nothing, I mean no thing that could be named. And yet it's alive. And I suppose I first noticed this, I don't remember when it was, but somewhere along the line it was no seen here that I, what I call I, 
was part of the, what was seen. And then an interest came up. Well, if I is part of the play, if you like, in the Shakespearean sense of the word, it then showed me that I, this I that we normally use, is like a conditioned pattern from my field of experience, where other people's field of experience, the other side of the world, their conditioned aspect of I could be in opposition to mine. And I began to see this as a play, like the play of nature and clouds and cows and fields and wind and life out there. I began to see the field of, of play, the play in this Shakespearean sense, all the world's a stage. Um, at that the emotions and feelings, perceptions, sensations are the players. And then, of course, as soon as that's seen, you question, hey, what sees that? And I have never been able to speak it truly. And I don't think anybody can. And I think that's why, through the centuries, there have been amazing stories, fairy stories, teaching stories, parables that allude to this, which actually can't be directly said. I mean, even when asked, Jesus only managed to say, I am that I am. Well, that doesn't tell sensibleness a lot, does it? Well, I can only say that my experience became um, that my drawings through my life became more accurate and bored me. They were accurater and described what was going on well enough. And as I looked round the world and the galleries, I saw a lot of apparently good work, expensive work, which bored me. And I began to question why. And um, I began to see that, that drawing anyway, and painting to some degree, was a technique had been learned to achieve something. And it did achieve getting it right and getting it accurate and getting it praised and even selling it. But it didn't achieve touching this that, ha that I spoke of that was lonely in me for, ah oh yes, that feels real. And then through the drawings that I was doing, which I didn't really know this was happening while it was happening, it, it happened and I was amazed myself as it happened. I thought, wow, the way you do the marks shows. So I began to see in my students and in myself that um, <coughs> the marks get it right were heavy and dull and boring. And the marks, when it could be just left, there was genuine exploring, like as if you were the model, and, and, and I touched you, but I did it on the paper, and I was opened by the atmosphere of your pose, say, that those marks carried something which was interesting, which was juicy, which was, oh, wow. And yet they didn't ha make any sense. So slowly, as I began to see, actually, if I stick to what I feel, it looks better than what I know. It sort of opened up new possibilities. So <clears throat> then I used to say to the people who wanted to come and model for the workshops, um, which they'd say, what do you want me to do? And I said, actually, I don't want you to do anything. I want you to just sit completely still or stand completely still, like grass or like a crop, wheat or barley. Um, and that that doesn't move until the breeze comes in and, as it were, gives an invitation to the, the grass or the crop to participate in its movement. And so the wind and the barley or the grass dance together, as it were. And then I say, that's when I, you can, when it's natural, you move. And you let the music pick you up and you don't mind where you go, you're just carried by the music. 
And, and then somebody will say, when you get into something that's beautiful, somebody will say, hold it, and that becomes the pose. And then to the students and to the drawers, us drawers who are drawing, I would say, now, now, just, just don't do anything like the grass. Until the, the pose, which is now a, a mixture of the pose and the music that brought the pose, blew the pose here, you could say, has a response in you. And when that response come up, like now, with, with Morag here, I just touch what touches me. It could be her face. It often is the head or the face, because it's a very potent aspect of the human. And then after touching the, the quietness on the paper of this face, I would wait there until something else on the pose resonates. In this case, funnily enough, it's this foot. So I touch the foot, and then, and then this leg comes up with the hand on it and the other hand across the face. And then you get into a kind of dance with the pose, and you follow your feeling finding out what it feels like, almost like a lover on a body, but you do it on the paper. And, and I discovered that, the, the, of course, there's a lot of mess on the paper. <coughs> and the mess is because we don't know the language of this. We don't know the language of touch. We have no idea how much we don't know how to touch each other. So we begin to find a language in our fingers, in our hands, and in our nails, and our knuckles, and our tenderness in the inquiry, wow, I don't know what this feels like. How does it feel? So I kind of drink it up and let it out. And over time, this makes a new language. I would absolutely say that the body is an instrument. It is, actually, it is our instrument. It's all we need, actually. And I discovered after I'd been doing this for a longish time that I was only alive from here up for 50 or more years. I hadn't included my body in my life. How radically shocking is that? And actually, I think it's true of nearly all of us, unless we've been graced by perceptions early on in our lives by good teaching, which is certainly barely available, but it's not in our education system, you could say. <coughs> so <coughs> I think the first thing that happened for me was that as this began to open, this field of enjoying touching on the paper, that which was touched here, <coughs> It mirrored in here an empty field, you could say, which was willing to listen, if you like, to hear, to listen to the point of hearing and being slowly li like it was un unbuttoned. And With that unbuttering, there's a different field of hearing. You see what I mean? So there are two languages being learned. There's the, the, there's the, there's the, the, or the intimacy, the, the two intimacies, the intimacy with our naked reality of being nothing, no thing. And then there's the intimacy well, three, really. The intimacy of our, our touching this. And this is an A, B, C, D, E, F, all the way through to Z or Z, is a language just in these, these here, into which I would include this suppleness here and this willingness to be completely dislocated from being prescribed by the brain. That's already one language. And then, so we have two intimacies now, one here, one with the body itself. And, and then the other is with the instruments that we use. And that is a, another language 
and each instrument has its own nature, you could say. <coughs> so some melt in water and are slippery and juicy and wonderful. Others are strong like the reeds, quite articulate and can be feisty and strong and, 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 and have different aspects to them. Like one edge is hard and one is softened and they've got corners and they've got their bits here. So there's, a, there's quite a little A, B, C, D, E, F, G within the end of one instrument, different facets of, of just the end of an instrument. And then there are different facets of how you hold the instrument and how the weight of the instrument is. And if you hold it like this, and if you, or if you hold it like this, or if you get him to hold it like a pencil, it, it's so interesting. It goes back straight into what we know. And it shows. I can go around and see a beautiful drawing. What happened there? Oh, yes, I, my instrument slipped back into, into this. And, and, and you can see it. And then there's the beautiful um, quill. Which, which is, likes to fly, likes to be light, like, hates to be held, only needs to be held strongly enough to support it. So it, it's as if it, through, like a piece of flex, doesn't have the light in it. It simply supports the energy of the light. The quill likes to be supported, and it just sings the song. And this character doesn't really know what's going to come out. But when we're intimate with this and this and the instrument, it just comes out by grace, you could say, in a most truthful, touching, responsive way that is appropriate and has got the atmosphere of the pathos of humanity within the pose, though it may not be accurate. People talk about beauty and people write poetry and you read poetry and a lot of it doesn't do anything to you and a lot of apparently accomplished drawings don't do anything that's worth having. And I began to realize that <coughs> here beauty and poetry are simply and only when the form, whatever the form is, the, the, the pose or, or uh, the slant of a hill or the sound of a piece of music or the way the words are put together in a poem uh, carry the, the, what I call the fragrance of the formless. What Cezanne very beautifully called the fragrance of eternity. If our drawings don't carry that fragrance, as far as I'm concerned, they can go in the bin. They just are not interesting anymore. They used to be interesting when photography didn't happen and for all manner of reasons, records needed to be made, it was fine. But now we don't need that. And we do, in, as far as I can see, urgently need to find our humanity. Because, um, you know, if we look around the planet, we look in our families, there's war everywhere in relationships, in marriages, with children, continents, with countries, countries within countries. And we're, all, we're only at war from conditioned aspects of opinions. You do it differently, bang, bang, I shoot you, I'm right. And um, <coughs> so I just found that this way of, of, of touching humanity through the form and um, the, of course, the, because the models just are moved by whatever music comes on, it could be rumbustious or it could be very, very quiet, or right, the whole range of music. Um, they go through the whole range of human pathos, if you like. And when we are faithful to touching just that, that touches us, the formless carried by the form. I th think that's the way, one of the ways that, it just sounds funny to say it maybe, but that's the way consciousness or sacredness 
knows itself by the taste of itself being truly lived. First we find, I found it on paper here, and then I find it in my life. And now to me that giving the sacred, you could call it God, I'm just nervous of using the word, but sacredness, allowing it to live as it truly is, feeds back to it the, f the taste of itself dancing in the manifest world. And um, I feel that that is all we can do. It, it, it apparently has made the manifest world in order to, to taste itself. And it seems that a humorous way and often not so humorous. The manifest world is the way it does taste itself. And it needs the taste of itself for its own continual manifestation. That's how it appears to be. It's maybe a bit of a story hopping in there off my mind. So uh, to me, that's a senior to morality now but that I, I am actually totally true to the invitation to, to, for sacredness to live its truth as it wants by what I call this meat ball. <laughs> Not a very graceful word for a body, but... <laughs> cross over back into living now, which to me is really what this drawn home is about. Uh, um, it, is, it is so easy we miss it. It is so natural to listen to ourself, to live our truth. It's so easy and natural, we think it can't be that easy. We can't be there because the religions, and understandably, the cultures have said, you know, it's blissful, it's omniscience, it's magnificence, it's blissful, it's blah, blah. And so when this quiet silence opens in one, the mind hops in and says, can't be that easy, must be more to it than that. And then we go out there and we look for it. And we spend a, a, all our lives often looking for it, and even die looking for it. And yet it's here all the time. It's so simple. And I, 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 it's as simple as actually just here with us here, or in a class, just here with a group of people just to sit quietly for a moment and ask ourselves, am I here too? Am I here? And to, and to <coughs> well, it's not for nothing, I suppose, that I start the workshops nearly always with a uh, photograph of a, of a child soon after it's born because it's evident in this little baby's face that life is there, but nobody's there. And over time, I discovered that that, I, might, I mean, this sounds incredibly childish probably, but I, I have gone so childish that I imagined I had just been born. So I just slipped out, and what was there? Nothing, except, yeah, like when we wake up in the morning, we just wake up and we open our eyes, and sometimes we don't know where we are. We just know, or we don't know, but uh, we're here. And then <coughs> the mind comes in and starts organizing the day, 
and the story of the day covers this very simple state that is hiding behind the story. And that's what I found when I said I didn't know what I wanted and I didn't know what I liked. I found this was what I wanted and this is what I like. The taste of myself, which is, you could call it God, I prefer to call it quietness. A spacious, no thing, mystery of life alive and enjoying itself as well as witnessing and seeing itself as a play. <coughs> and I th would go so far as to say once this is located, and seen, tasted, abided with, uh, long enough to say, ah, oh, oh, yes, ah, mm, me, yes, ah. And, and there's this kind of, oh, like cradling something you love. When that's been tasted strong enough, we're safe, anything can happen to us, because we know this is always here. It forget, we forget like the sun isn't always shining because there are clouds and we think, oh, it's a horrible day, the sun's fallen out of the sky, but no, the sun hasn't fallen out of the sky and this hasn't gone away. The sun gets covered by grey clouds and, and we get covered with thoughts, perceptions, sensations, which we call I, and that covers this um, mystery of seeing. You could call it simply, see, simply seeing, even witnessing is too strong. And actually, just in this respect, um, it happened to me quite a long way along the line, and it really woke up something in me. Going back in, I must have been reading something. And I suppose for us in the West, the, the Christian story plays its hand about virginity, and you know, you shouldn't, you should be a virgin. It used to be when I was young, you can't, must be a virgin when you get married, and all the blah, blah, blah about virgins, physical. So I thought, I'm going to look up this word and see what the root of it really is. And there was a whole blah about <coughs> virgins, physical. Um, and, and then at, right at the end it said, something, virgin means something to which nothing has been added. And I thought, oh wow, how beautiful is that? We slip out into the world alive and nothing's been added. And then what gets added is beautiful until it totally covers up the virginity of being. And unless we find a way back to this virgin spaciousness, this virginity of no thing, so these inner doors somehow, by me, one means or another, become open. And then the mystery is seen to be there, living. And the, the, for my, but the best way I have found that and located that is sim through simple quietness. And actually, there's a very lovely metaphor also in our seasons. You know, winter looks as though it's, it, 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 the beautiful flowering of, autumn, of summer goes, yields to autumn, beautiful. All the things fall off, the rains come, the snow comes, the mud comes. From nature's point of view, God, I've died. It's, it's over. But if, if, when it really bites, if winter's allowed, if we are allowed to stay in, for instance, you could equate winter with God, I don't know what's going on. I don't know anything. I don't actually know. If we can hold that, which I couldn't for years, I couldn't hold that, God, I'm a mess, I don't know what I'm doing. When I learnt to stay with the truth of what is, which was winter, actually I don't know anything. I need to start again. And I can't start again. I'm married, I've got kids, I've got a house, I've got a mortgage, I've got blah, blah. 
can't start again. But, but to let this just be there, raw, like winter, like nothing. In that nothing, that yielding to nothing, there is an opening. And that opening is where the light shines, right in the depths of the darkness of not knowing. And my experience is you, you slowly then get a new life. Mm -hmm.